Morag, I don't need to tell you, is an internationally celebrated scholar of socio-legal studies who's at the very vanguard of that emerging, emerging movement that um, tries to connect high-quality academic work with the local community partners. Before I hand over to her, let me retrace some of the, the steps that she's travelled to stand before you here today. What I learned today was that Morag actually did her first degree in physics, um, which is somewhat unusual for an academic lawyer. Um, but she decided against further professional study of atoms and subatomic particles, waves and radiation, etc., and instead uh, pursued uh, a career working in local government, in housing associations and housing cooperatives. And she gained 15, 15 years' worth of experience in that world, which I think has been a decisive influence on her research subsequently. Um, after 15 years, she decided to do a graduate dip diploma in law, and then after that came here as a student in 2001 uh, to do an LLM in public law. And that set her on an academic trajectory that's seen her um, emerge to um, become Professor of Social Legal Studies in this university. Um, she did her PhD under Peter Molpas, who's sitting at the back of the room, uh, and with a co-supervisor, Dave Cowan, um, another internationally recognised name in Social Legal Studies, um, towards the back left of the room. Uh, she started teaching at the law school, joined us as lecturer in 2004, and rose rapidly through the ranks, uh, becoming Professor of Socio-Legal Studies, which is the cause for today's lecture. M Maura, congratulations on your terrific achievement. Thank you uh, for being such an inspirational member of our academic community, a vital part of our research culture, and thanks in anticipation for the wonderful lecture that you're about to give. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So maybe I'll just go home. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Ken. Now, oops. before I start, I'd like to say a few words about this man. Um, this is Gareth Williams. Gareth Williams really sadly died last Thursday, the 14th of September. Gareth worked with me and quite a number of other people in this room on the research programme that we've been doing for the last five years, Productive Margins, Regulating for Engagement. I'm going to talk about that later, unsurprisingly. Mm -hmm. He was a professor of sociology at Cardiff University, a well-known figure in the field of health sociology, and a great academic and a fun person to have as a collaborator. Like me, he was inspired by the work of John Berger. Gareth's death leaves a great big hole in our lives, and I'm dedicating this lecture to Gareth. About five years ago, I wrote a paper with my friend and colleague, Sue Cohen. It was called, When Things Fall Apart, we sold the story of Sue's experience as director of the Single Person Action Network that showed how mechanisms of governance, of which regulation is the most ubiquitous, can so easily move from being productive to alienating. Louis McNeese, a poet from the north of Ireland, who, like me, came to be an inhabitant of Bristol, puts it this way. I am not yet born, rehearse me, in the parts I must play and the cues I must take when old men lecture me, bureaucrats hector me, mountains frown at me, lovers laugh at me, and white waves call me to folly and the desert calls me to doom and the beggar refuses my gift and my children curse me. In this lecture, I will be drawing on my experiences as a practitioner in the world of social housing and on the understandings I have developed as an academic here in the privileged environment of Bristol University. I want to show in this lecture why regulatory systems need new ways of seeing and knowing that can bring into the centre the expertise and experience of communities who find themselves at the margins and why these new systems of seeing and knowing require universities to become part 
of a community-focused infrastructure that can put thinking about social justice at the centre of research and practice. However, before beginning, perhaps I'd better say a few words about this regula word regulation. I'm using it here in a much broader sense than we tend to use the word regulations as rules or laws passed by the local council or central government or the EU. Regulatory systems include the supermarkets who govern what food we can buy as much as the council's planning departments who determine where those supermarkets can be. Those of us who study regulation tend to think of it as processes that seek to change behaviour and govern how outcomes are achieved. Processes that are codified in the sense that there are rules of the game, but these are not necessarily always written down. Regulatory systems engage both the regulator and the organisational person that's being regulated. And important for my lecture today, regulation can be facilitative, leaving open the possibility of experimentation and innovation. To go on to the beginnings. I grew up in Scotland, which has a very long coastline and many lochs. White waves have called me to inspiration. The waves that you saw in the previous slide are in fact not Scotland, but the west of Ireland. My surrogate Scotland and my place of refuge from bureaucracy and from Brexit. When I was a teenager, my father taught me to sail. I have many rich memories of evenings with my mum and my dad and my sister trying to manoeuvre our boat around a sailing course whilst the fickle winds on the loch tried to make us do otherwise. Learning to sail was a lesson in taking advantage of what comes towards you, of tacking so that you can sail into the wind, of running before the wind. All concepts that I've found useful since and particularly when thinking about regulation. I also suspect that exploring those remote inlets and craggy cliffs of Scotland coastline was my first fascination with the margins. Scotland is also proud of its education system. It certainly did me proud, and it landed me up in Oxford studying, as Ken has told you, physics. However, whilst the fascination for analysing and working out how things worked stuck, studying physics did not. In the Easter of my first year, a general election was called. I spent a hectic six weeks campaigning on Blackbird Lees, a large housing estate on the periphery of Oxford, for the local Labour MP, Andrew Smith. He was elected, but this being 1979, not many of his party colleagues were. My emergence from a world of matter into a world of politics and government was framed then by the ideology of Thatcherism. My political life as a student union activist led me to a concern for housing issues. In Oxford, as in Bristol, a pressing concern was that the demand for student housing was fo forcing rents and house prices up, creating real problems of affordable housing for others. This work, as an activist, led me into urban renewal. In the early 1980s, I worked as a housing renewal officer for Leicester City Council. This is one of the houses that was in one of our renewal areas. Urban renewal was, for a while, a central plank of UK housing policy made possible by the Housing Act 1974. Urban renewal strategies focused resources on geographically small housing action areas. In Leicester, this meant households and communities being involved in the shaping of outcomes, what an area looked like, through improvement grants for individual houses and, in, and environmental works, from enveloping schemes to play areas, to importing from the Netherlands ideas of the self-regulation of cars, bikes and people in what is called a Verneuf. So, and thanks to our Dutch colleague here for correcting my pronunciation. And this was um, the scheme that we imported from uh, the Netherlands into, um, into Leicester. And thanks to John for the photograph here. Urban renewal then was a community-focused set of policies that made real differences to areas of rundown housing and communities at the margins. It meant providing resources that supported new communities. Much of Leicester's poorest quality private housing was home to black and minority ethnic families. Many had been expelled from Uganda. They lived in, the in housing that was sometimes about to fall down, 
because that was all they could afford and because they were unable to access the council's own housing stock. Urban renewal held the potential that housing policy could allow for openness. The success of urban renewal re relied on councils taking a very localised approach, listening to and acting with local communities. However, alongside these soft forms of governing, we also relied on having strong legal powers. For example, so that we could take action against landlords who left properties empty and derelict for years, or properties that caused a nuisance in the neighbourhood. The power of compulsory purchase, or CPO, was an important tool of urban renewal. 42 Chandos Road, the subject of this notice, was famous in Leicester because it was CPO'd twice. Once because the landlord had left it vacant for so long it was falling into disrepair, and then again when it became reoccupied because all night raves harassed the local residents. The Housing Act 1974 was also vital for the transformation of the previously marginal world of voluntary housing societies and charities into a large housing association, housing association sector that has become a key player in UK housing policy. It did this by setting up a system of regulation overseen by the government regulator, the Housing Corporation, which enabled registered housing associations to get grants for building new housing and doing up old housing stock. For example, those properties that we had CPO'd in Leicester and then were passed on to housing associations. In the 1960s, a new breed of housing associations had emerged, many of them associated with shelter. It came about at the same time as this, the film Kathy Come Home was screened, which was set up in 1966 to tackle homelessness. These housing associations, some of them housing cooperatives, saw themselves as activists, they were set up to tackle the need for housing in the poorest, most economically marginalised communities. They talked about themselves as a voluntary housing movement. By the late 1980s, after nearly a decade of the right to buy and various other ideologically driven housing policies designed to take power away from local government, housing associations and even housing cooperatives were politically acceptable for a different reason. They were, after all, not the state, but a sort of private sector. So housing associations have become the favoured vehicle. Homelessness, spiralling in the late 1980s and early 90s, was to be fi fixed not so much by building new houses, but by private sector leasing schemes. Councils leasing properties from private owners, which were managed by housing associations and populated by households from the, local ca from the council's homelessness list. In hindsight... These leasing schemes can be seen as a precursor of a move away from public grants to private finance for the social housing association sector. My role in housing associations has always been in development. The team that works on building new homes or finding ways of bringing old properties back into usefulness. At one time, I remember being asked to look at this building. Many of you will know Westmoreland House in Stokes Croft. We were asked to see if we could convert it into short life units to provide temporary housing for homeless people. Apart from its general dilapidation, one of the biggest problems of Westmoreland House was the lack of viable fire escape access. The building being so close to its neighbours that without extensive demolition of surrounding buildings, it couldn't be of any use. There were a myriad of technical problems that had to be overcome in order to create utility. Many of these problems were legal or regulatory, and the most important regulatory factor for us was generally money. In the Housing Association development team, we knew we were regulated. We were regulated by our finance director and her spreadsheet, which would tell her if a scheme was viable, financially viable that was, and we were also regulated by the Housing Corporation, the state regulator and funder of the housing association sector. In this period, I continue to be concerned with ways in which organisations can be made open, more participative and democratic. I worked in the housing cooperative sector as a development worker in what's called a secondary housing corp. These were organisations that supported the development of tenant-owned and managed housing corps. They provided services such as rent collecting, managing the finances, advising on management problems and training co-op members, and all the legal technicalities of setting up co-ops in the first place. 
Secondary housing co-ops were an important infrastructure to support democratic participatory housing solutions. At the same time, they were controlled by their members, the housing co-ops. I'll return at the end of the lecture to this need for an infrastructure to support participatory engaged regulatory systems. Given this background, it's hardly surprising that in the next phase of my life, it was the legal and regulatory systems that became my spaces for exploration. My periods of dealing with legal contracts, lawyers and statutory legalities led me to a law degree and from there a desire to understand the spaces of regulation I had been inhabiting. Through my teacher, then colleague and friend, Dave Cowan, I came to social theory and in, in particular to Michel Foucault, histories of the present and governmentality. I still remember the moment of revelation when I read the paper that Dave suggested I should read by Nicholas Rose and Peter Miller, Political Power Beyond the State, where they described how the development of the welfare state had enabled the authority of experts, largely professionals, teachers, doctors, planners, and engineers to become inextricably linked to political institutions and mechanisms of govern, government to govern at a distance. However, Rosa Mirrell argued that from the late 1970s onwards, a shift in expertise took place in the context of a political ideology that demanded a diminished role for the state and a valorization of markets. This was managerialism, behaving in a business-like way, leading to another form of state, the managerial state, which was so elegantly interrogated by John Clark and Janet Newman two others who've guided me in my journey through social theory. In their work and others, inspired by Foucault, I recognised the world I had inhabited as a social housing practitioner. It was at this point that I met Peter Malpass, who was then Professor of Housing at the University of Western England. Peter was the leading scholar on housing associations. He had collaborated with the National Housing Federation, which described itself as the trade body of the housing association sector, to get a grant from the Economic and Social Research Council for a PhD study on the history of the National Housing Federation. I became that PhD student, and my PhD became a study of the regulation of the housing association sector. I shall always be grateful to Peter, not just for the enormous fund of knowledge, but for being open, letting go of his idea, and allowing it to become mine. Inspired by Foucault's methodology of histories of the present, that is, understanding the conditions that make it possible for the particular present that we occupy to have come about. I began to see the subtleties of regulation. Organisations that are subject to regulation always feel that it is something that has been done to them. Housing associations were no exception. They portray a process by which external bodies, usually the state, impose upon them systems of control. All they can do, they claim, is work within these systems. However, if we study regulatory systems in practice, we don't see this top-down hierarchical form of governing, but rather regulatory spaces, each occupied by a multiplicity of actors, official regulators, in my study, the Housing Corporation, working alongside the organisations that are ostensibly the target of regulation, and a myriad of other bodies such as banks, building societies, ratings agencies and local authorities. One of the central planks, central arguments of my book, Governing Independence and Expertise, The Business of Housing Association, was that those housing associations who had developed through working with shelter were able to position themselves as experts who understood the sector and the needs of government. They worked through the National H Federation of Housing Associations, as it was called then, to shape the Housing Act 1975, creating a regulatory territory in which registered associations like them would be eligible for public grants. They became a new regulatory community. Through getting themselves into this position, they were able to make the sector central to UK housing and regeneration policy. My argument there was part of a tradition of socio-legal research that employs representations of social space to convey a portrayal of law as top-down, replacing it with a more nuanced, three-dimensional understanding of the productions of norms and of common sense. Indeed, the argument opens up questions of the subject position of, regulatory, of the regulatory 
sorry, regular T's, here the housing associations, within a regulatory system. Their position as being subject to, to the control of a regulator is only part of the story. As they make themselves subjects of the regulatory system, they shape their own identity and they shape the identity of the actors around them. So, theories of regulation and practice in regulation over recent decades have shifted from regulation as hierarchical, operating through mechanisms con command and control, to ideas of regulation as decentered. This focus on the fragmentary and dispersed nature of regulatory power leads us to think in terms of regulatory spaces. Here, perhaps we're returning to my science background. In regulatory space, the resources of and the relations between the various occupants of the space are critical in holding it together. We can think of these as powers of association, to borrow from Latour, which create interdependencies between the actors as human and non-human items are exchanged and bargained as part of the functioning of power. Here, power and knowledge are inextricably linked, so the knowledge of how to make the housing association sector work that the National Federation of Housing Associations claimed put them in a position where they could exercise power in shaping legislation and a new regulatory re regime that worked for them. But power is not static, not a thing that can be held. Rather, power operates through action. So the Housing Corporation had power as much as it, through its ability to apply and withdraw funding from housing associations as it did through its auditing and inspection processes. However, the ways in which regulation has been put into practice contains very narrow understandings of who and what forms part of the regulatory system. The occupants of regulatory space are generally restricted to relatively powerful organisations. The regulatory the companies or organisations that are to be regulated, along with their advisors, consultants, financiers and others. There is little room for engagement from individuals and communities who also experience being regulated. For example, by the decisions of supermarkets as to where they're going to locate and what to sell, or of housing associations, of what they build and who they house. Engagement seldom moves beyond establishing a consumer advisory panel or tenant, having a tenant on a housing association board. I want to argue that decentered regulation has indeed closed down possibilities for engagement by citizen. This ex exclusion arises from a number of directions. Firstly, regulation is technocratic. It deploys a specialist expertise. It appears to be non-ideological, appears neutral, and that makes it very attractive to government and others. As Julia Black has shown, whilst regulators see knowledge as fragmented and constructed, requiring information held by multiple actors to make regulation work. My concern is that they only recognise the knowledge of organisations, those organisations that are the targets, subjects of regulation, like the, and their consultants and financiers. And so systems become internally referential. This also happens through a second mechanism. The invention of regulatory systems and practices themselves arise not only from a desire to present prevent a social harm or promote a social good, but also, as we saw in the, my example of the housing association sector, protect a field from intrusion by outsiders, by others. The design of a regulatory system thus reflects the needs of the actors inside the system to create their own authority and control. Third, the tools of decentered regulation, risk-based and self-regulation, also narrow down that focus. Risk based regulation, seen as reducing the burden of regulation by targeting resources, focuses those resources on organisations judged in the, re the regulator's frame of reference to pose the greatest risk. This frequently ignores wider societal risks and challenges. Similarly, self-regulation, also in vogue because it seemingly saves resources, places the organisation or sector at the centre of regulatory practice. Regulations passed down to the level of the firm or sector who are required to establish their forms of monitoring and inspection, again leading to practices and procedures based on internal, that's internal to the organisation or to the sector, on the internal forms of knowledge. So, decentered regulation and the tools and techniques that gives rise to it. <coughs> 
results in spaces open only to regulators working alongside relatively powerful actors. This decentering of, de of regulation may have produced more efficient and effective regulation from the perspective of regulators and regulated organisations. However, these multiple discrete systems that have evolved, their technocratic fixes to the regulatory problems allow little, if any, reference to the lived experience of those who themselves are regulated, the person seeking asylum, those living in poor housing, or simply wanting to buy healthy, affordable food. So this is where I stood in about 2010. The understanding of a practitioner who'd worked in local government, housing associations and housing cooperatives, who'd become increasingly disenchanted with the housing association sector, that had become dominated by acting as a business. Then, as an academic, studying regulation and seeing, again, the domination of market thinking. The question was, how could research carried out in the privileged space of the university be used to open up understandings of law and regulation? It was this question that led me to two separate but interconnected research programmes that, thanks to the generosity, creativity and insights of my collaborators, many of whom are here in this room, has made me think that maybe we can begin to answer this question. Productive Margins Regulating for Engagement was a collaboration between community organisations and higher education researchers. The programme started from the point that those who find themselves at the margins, economically, socially, politically, can and are productive. We wanted to turn ideas of expertise on their head and experiment with ways in which the creative potentialities of communities at the margins could be brought into the decision-making structures of regulatory systems to find ways of regulating for engagement. The focus of experimentation was also on academia itself. The Productive Margins programme sought to turn the university inside out and outside in. The research programme was not designed, as is traditional in academia, just by the academics, but in a research forum made up of community development practitioners and academics from across the social sciences, arts and humanities. Our research methods were developed by working groups of community members, community organisation workers and academic researchers, and data was collected by community researchers and analysed and written in a similarly collaborative way. Turning expertise on its head was also the focus of the other research programme I ran concurrently with Productive Margins. This one was called New Sites of Legal Consciousness, a case study of the role of UK advice agencies. The main site of exploration of this study was citizens' advice. The understanding of citizen in the context of citizens' advice has resonances with co-production, a citizen-to-citizen -citizen network of advice giving, in which citizens trained up as advisors give advice and support to other citizens in tackling their problems, many of which had a legal angle. The voluntary advice sector could be said to have had an ethos of citizenship as the right to have rights, as Hannah Arendt has put it. Their aim to make the legal realm accessible to all through free-to-access advice that does not exclude through financial status or legal status for that matter. What the advice sector does at its best is recognise the productive potential of knowledge that is gained from experience as much as expertise gained from books. Advice workers, often previously advice clients, engage with a client's problem through trying to untangle its complexities, supporting them to engage with this complexity and work together to produce solutions. However, this only works because volunteers work alongside and supported by paid specialists and by lawyers. And the difficulty is that austerity measures are threatening to strip out this vital support. However, advice organisations like the community organisations who collaborated in the productive margins are also involved in something more. They seek to engage with those regulatory systems that are the cause of their clients' problems and attempt to change them. They are involved not simply in the delivery advice of advice to individuals, but in co the collective concern that translates personal grievances into matters of public concern. They are engaged in acts of translation. 
in a complex and non-linear way. They listen to... They listen to those who seek them out for advice and give back a translation of what is possible to address, their, uh, how it's possible to address the specific grievance. These personal stories tell other stories of where the legal-illegal boundary is being misused or misinterpreted and where regulatory systems are failing citizens or stifling them or just plain, plain baffling them. They take up these personal stories, identify the collective issues that must be addressed, remove them from the domain of individual person experience, rearrange them, add other stories and statistics, and then they represent them as matters of public concern, translating them for policymakers into issues that should be addressed. At one point, I used this image of the Celtic spiral as a way of trying to think about the interconnectedness of what is going on. My friend and co-worker Janet Newman has said that this is a particularly challenging moment to try to theorise transformations of power and expertise. And here I'm certainly not argu arguing for doing away with experts or that we put ordinary people on a pedestal. Rather, I want to call into question assumptions about what counts as expert knowledge and rethink the ways of seeing that inform the practices of regulation. John Berger who you will uh, recognise has been very influential in this title, said in his book and television series, Ways of Seeing, that we only see what we look at. To see is an act of choice. Berger's focus was on the ways in which art is seen. But I think, and clearly Gareth thought, his insights were highly relevant to us today in other fields. We need new ways of seeing and knowing regulation, Ways that engage the expertise and experience of communities at the margins of regulatory decision-making. Co-production, engaging citizens in the collaborative production of new knowledge, is, I would argue, a critical element in seeing and knowing differently. It has become a key mechanism in research and in developing public services. However, here, there should be a big red warning signal on the, mm -hmm. on the, um, on the screen. It is often reappropriated and used as a mean for cutting those public services. Productive margins explored how to harness the creative agencies of communities at the margins to productively engage with regulatory structures, both in creating specific interventions and generalised social change. This collaboration of academics and civil society organisations use co-production and multidisciplinary creative practices as both a method methodology and a site of investigation. Co-production and thinking about the methods deployed to gain knowledge can provide new ways of seeing regulation. In one project, community members, alongside researchers and artists, wrote this novel, Life Chances, a work of sociological fiction, in which storylines generated from the experience of those in the room, in those who took part in the workshops, showed the impact of regulatory systems such as benefits, housing, immigration and child protection. Another project explored loneliness and isolation in older people. Interviews of older people by older people about isolation and loneliness were translated into a series of monologues which powerfully, powerfully portrayed the ways in which retirement or a loss of a partner can lead to extreme debilitating loneliness. These monologues have been performed many times, including at a Utopias festival in Somerset House, which somewhat ironically, took place, <laughs> yes, but several were in the, took place the weekend after the Brexit referendum. And it was this that led to this comment, chalked on the side of the lonely performance shed. Other projects explored engaging Muslim, Bristol's Muslim community in, dis in decision making. There was, who decides what's in my fridge? about how our food habits are regulated. And another project about young people's perceptions of their neighbourhood in Merthyr. All these, pro all these projects demonstrated a complex and mesh-like view of regulatory systems with daily life as a constant negotiation 
in many layers, from social workers to the asylum and immigration system, from the demands of employers to supermarkets regulating healthy access to healthy, affordable food. Each is a system with its own internal logic, frequently opaque to users of the system. The many layers create a laminated and impenetrable mesh. So this here was one of our workshops near the end of the research programme where those who were involved in it were asked to, with, were given a whole load of different things and asked to construct something that described the regulatory systems they'd been researching. And this was the food group um, who found a Sainsbury's paper bag, which is a polythene bag, which they put over their complicated structure to show the opaqueness of the system that they were trying to delve into. So, ways of knowing. Here, from Elizabeth Bishop. It is like what we imagine knowledge to be. Dark, salt, clear, moving, utterly free, drawn from the cold, half, hard mouth of the world, derived from the rocky breasts, forever flowing and drawn. And since our knowledge is historical, flowing and flown by a poem of hers called At the Fish Houses. So if knowledge is flowing and free, our ways of knowing need also to be open and flowing. For universities to be treating knowledge as a commodity to be bought, think tuition fees or sold, think consultancy, is to be looking in entirely the wrong direction. And to be putting knowledge in boxes of academic knowledge and practitioner knowledge without mechanisms for the co-working of these different knowledges is to narrow our vision, to, dare I say, exclude the possibility of knowing. I often turn, turn to Seamus Heaney. This is from his book Seeing Things. I remember this woman who sat for years in a wheelchair looking straight ahead out of the window at sycamore trees. Face to face with her was an education of the sort that you got across a well-braced gate, deeper into the country than you expected, and discovered that the field beyond the hedge grew more distinctly strange as you kept standing, focused and drawn in by what barred the way. Knowing is not just what is learnt in school or university, though Heaney pays due respect to his formal education, but involves keeping open our field of vision to the strangeness of things. It is perhaps, as Leonard Cohen said, about seeing through the cracks where the light gets in. However, inequalities of power and expertise cannot be altered through co-production alone. Politics matters too. For regulatory systems to engage communities at the margins as actors in regulation, rather than the subjects of regulation, we need structures and processes that can translate expertise by experience into possibilities for engagement. We need an infrastructure for intermediation, translation and brokering. For, as my much-missed friend and colleague Bronwyn Morgan has put it, for experientially sensitive infrastructure. One organisation in Productive Margins spoke of themselves as experts in nothing. Nothing and everything. From running community centres, day centres, day nurseries and lunch clubs to calling on other experts as needed, from translating between local communities and citizens and regulators to creating space for activists to act, rather than become bogged down in bureaucracy. So, for example, the group of researchers who created that Elonely research and the performances have formed LILAC, the Local Isolation and Loneliness Action Committee. LILAC wanted to get on with the work of of an action committee. They didn't want to get bogged down in the technicalities of forming a registered association, nor to spend their time in administration. This was made possible because BS3 community, from which the, the association they'd grown out of, was able to bid for funding for a worker to support the LILAC team to administer the funding, allowing LILAC to get on with action. So, like the secondary housing cooperatives in the 1980s, they were creating an infrastructure for engagement. Organisations like BS3 Community are already engaged with regulatory systems as part of their day-to-day -day activity. Their role is strategic, their expertise geared to facilitating, mediating, nurturing networks, to deploying, 
cultural and local knowledge in ways that enable traditionally silent voices to be heard, along with the articulate, persistent and powerful, as another much missed colleague, Wendy Lana, has put it. Community-based organisations are as much infrastructure as roads and digital superhighways. They are infrastructure that is socio-political rather than simply technical or managerial. Thinking in terms of infrastructure makes us focus on the connectedness of social action rather than its isolation. Infrastructures allow for endurance. However, infrastructures are fragile. They constantly need maintenance and repair. Community-based organisations as infrastructure, traversed as they are by so many civil society groups and initiatives, need support from public and the public and private organisations that rely on their role as facilitators of engagement. Perhaps these geese are a better guide to what regulation should look like. It's a sort of structured chaos, the highly efficient V formation where the leadership role gets passed on when the goose, who's at the front, gets tired. In the research journey I have travelled, and in the collaborative relationships with many of, this, of you in this room, I've come to think, rethink that line from Yeats, the one that follows, the one that uh, Sue and I stole for our uh, paper. The next line is, the centre cannot hold. Thanks, in no short measure, to my companion, on Birmingham, I now think that part of our problem is this whole idea of the centre having to hold things together. Rather, we should be loosening up, allowing ourselves op to be open to serendipity, enabling things to emerge. In the fragile world of regulation, law and governing we occupy now, no one has expressed this better than Fintan O'Toole, writing in The Guardian on the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. He wrote, of the genius of the agreement, was that it moved the politics of the north of Ireland away from what are you prepared to die for to what are you prepared to live with. The core of the agreement was in the right of people born in the north to be Irish, this is to quote from the agreement, to be Irish or British or both, as they may choose. Those two short words, or both, and the political structures that the agreement created were a gamble that people could live with complexity, contingency and ambiguity. In my research journey, I've come to see that one of the most important things we can do is open up spaces of ambiguity, spaces that recognise that social justice is complex, but don't try to resolve it by imposing binary divides or absolute definitions. This is difficult for lawyers, whose training revolves around defining facts and creating decisions that something is either lawful or it is not. And it's di difficult for policymakers who want to define outcomes, targets, key performance indicators, squeezing out the possibility of creativity and new knowledges that can support ge community generated concepts of social justice. There are many of us in this room who, hoped that the who hope that the University of Bristol can be part of this opening up, that the university can it indeed be turned inside out. One opportunity has been created by this organisation, Barton Hill Settlement, set up in the 1900s as part of the university settlement movement to take academics and students out of their privileged environment into the community. Now, in 2018, Barton Hill Settlement wants to reinvigorate this relationship. They have invited into their space the university to take part in a new development, the micro-settlement, to co-create with local communities a space for reflection and action, for co-created research and teaching. We hope this will become the prototype for the new Temple Key campus for the University of Bristol, putting social justice at its heart. Louis McNeese, who I opened with, gets the last word. The final verse of Prayer Before Birth perhaps provides us an in with an inspiration of what seeing and knowing differently might look like. I am not yet born, provide me, with water to dandle me, grass to grow for me, trees to talk to me, sky to sing to me, birds and a white light in the back of my mind to guide me. Thank you. <laughs>
Can I say a few more thank yous? I have a few more thank yous to say. Okay, okay. So I would like to say a few more thank yous. <laughs> I'd like to thank the law school and particularly the executive team for organising this lecture. For Beatrice, for helping me with the pictures as well as my Dutch pronunciation. <laughs> to John, here also in the room, John Sargent for providing me with other pictures. And to my friend, long time friend Anne Baines for also doing research on our shared history in housing. I want to thank everybody I've been working with, and there's too many of you to thank for providing me with inspiration, but I particularly want to thank Eva for staying with us and providing such a leadership role to the Welsh team Reflective Margins throughout Gareth's illness. And I want to thank my family, to Rosie and Brendan and to my mum and my dad and Tom for being there for me and for being with me on this journey that I've talked about today and to the artists in, the fam in my family for helping me see differently. I wish that my dad could be here today to have heard this. I'm sure I've forgotten others, but so thank you to you all. Thank you. Morag, of course, the biggest thank you today is to, to you for your wonderfully evocative uh, and richly resonant lecture, which uh, beautifully brought to life the different strands of your research and its richness of theoretical underpinning in a way that really made it accessible even to an inexpert such as myself. <laughs> uh, I, I was struck as I listened to you how you, actually your own life exemplified the principal themes of your research in that connectiveness of university and community uh, and that compassion for those at the margins. So, so thank you so much for letting us retrace that beautiful journey with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming.